episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation. We're going to be talking about 12 errors in addiction and eating disorder diagnosis and treatment. Um, and obviously, there's probably, well, I'm sure there's a lot more than 12 errors, but we're only going to cover 12 today. We're going to briefly review avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, substance use disorder, internet gaming disorder, gambling disorder, and sex, uh, sex addiction. So we're going to review those things because a lot of times um, people aren't real familiar with diagnosing some of the non-mood disorders. So we're going to talk about it a little bit, but we're specifically going to keep focusing more on differential diagnosis and some errors that might come up. So avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is an eating disturbance manifested by a persistent failure to meet appropriate nutrition or, and or energy needs associated with only one of the following. So it is really easy to get the ARFID diagnosis. Significant weight loss um, or, in the case of children, failure to achieve expected weight gain. Significant nutritional de dependency dependence on enteral feeding or oral nutritional supplements, and or marked interference with psychosocial functioning. So, you know, when I'm thinking about some children who tend to be really picky eaters, um, and I'm thinking about uh, people who are on various fad diets who've decided that they're swearing off entire groups of foods, um, uh, you know, I, I start thinking about this, and then I want to look at the criteria. Are they, do they have a nutritional deficiency? Um, are they having interference with psychosocial functioning, or um, are they having a significant weight loss, or are they fa failing to meet developmental goals? So those are all going to go through my mind if somebody is presenting with this issue, and we'll kind of talk about how it might come up in your office um, in this, there is no body dysmorphia or fear of becoming fat. So this issue with food is to do with the food itself, not because of a fear of fat or, or um, perception of some flaw in one's, in one's body. Okay, so the behavior is not better explained by lack of available food or by an associated culturally sanctioned practice. Now, culturally sanctioned practices, you know, we have in... A variety of religions there are periods of prescribed fasting but those periods of fasting are short um, there are also periods of um, restricted types of food intake um, I know my old boss used to go on um, the Ezekiel diet for a period of time it was a couple of months I think each year and you know so there were certain types of foods he couldn't eat during that period but that was a culturally sanctioned practice did he lose weight during that period sometimes um, was he meeting his nutritional goals overall probably yes he was um, in eating the diet that he was eating the behavior can't occur exclusively during the course of anorexia nervosa when you've got somebody who's just you know not willing to eat adequate amounts to sustain their their body fat um, but with anorexia remember there is a fear of fat or um, a significant effect of their body body image or their body size and shape on their self-image and we're going to talk about that can't occur exclusively during the course of bulimia or body dysmorphic disorder. So again, the restrictive food intake disorder has to do with the food itself, not anything to do with the body. The eating disturbance is not better attributed to a medical condition or better explained by another mental health disorder. When people are depressed, sometimes they just don't want to eat. It's not that they're fearing getting fat. They're just, they have no appetite. And even smelling it or tasting it kind of makes their tummy upset. Um, so we want to consider, is this a symptom of the depression or is this a standalone diagnosis? Look at anxiety. I don't know about you, but when I get really stressed out, I can't eat. You know, my, my stomach gets tied up in knots and I'm just like, oh, no, I don't want to eat anything. 
Um, so somebody who has persistent generalized anxiety may also have difficulty eating um, and may lose weight and rely on, um, what do they call it back here, um, nutritional supplements like Insure or whatever, just to meet their basic nutritional requirements. And obviously, we're going to be working with the anxiety and working with their primary care physician and their nutritionist to make sure they're getting comprehensive care. But it wouldn't qualify for ARFID if it's a part of or part of the symptoms of the depression or anxiety. If it's part of a psychotic disorder, if someone has a delusion that some food you know, is, is bad, is evil, it's going to do something to them. If they're in the middle of a psychotic episode, they may refuse to eat. Um, and it's rare, but it can happen. Or when we're talking about things like Crohn's disease, the person's stomach is, is painful and upset, and they're having difficulty ingesting and, and uh, processing Foods. They may refuse to eat. So we want to rule out the medical conditions, rule out the mood issues, rule out the other eating disorders, and then we may have this left over. One of the things that may bring someone into your office where you're having to try to figure out what the diagnosis is or if the person meets criteria is, for example, if an adolescent is brought by their parent to your office and they're like, this child won't eat, is restricting. And the child doesn't report fear of, fear of fat, doesn't report meeting the criteria for anorexia or bulimia. They are on a fad diet of sorts, um, or they have decided that this is their new eating pattern. And we want to look at it in terms of, is it causing them problems? I mean, if it's obviously causing conflict at home, so that could be a problem in psychosocial functioning. Um, but what is motivating this behavior in this particular adolescent at this time to see if it meets the criteria of a um, feeding disturbance or if, it's, if it doesn't quite meet that criteria? The good news is, if you're looking for a way to bill for this and they meet the criteria, then bada bing. So moving on to anorexia. So AF, uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, is probably what you would consider sort of your other, uh, not otherwise specified diagnosis. Anorexia, persistent restriction of energy uh, intake leading to significantly low body weight in context of what is minimally expected for physical health. So these are people who are well underweight. Now, I know a lot of people, um, especially adolescents, it's like they've got metabolisms that are through the roof, who have very, very low body weight um, and don't meet the criteria for anorexia. So we don't want to just say every person who is really, really thin is anorexic. They need to have an intense fear of gaining weight or, or becoming fat or the persistent behavior interferes with weight gain. So they may be doing things in order to prevent gaining weight, like exercising or purging. They experience a disturbance in the way their body weight or shape is experienced. And when I was in graduate school, um, I was able to assist somebody on their doctoral dissertation on eating disorders. And we had this cool little thing where we would take a picture of somebody in a black onesie leotard and we would distort it. You know, we would make it really, really big and distorted. So it was way out of proportion. You couldn't look at it and go, oh my gosh, is that what I look like? It was really obvious. It was like funhouse mirror sort of thing. And we would let them adjust the dials to get the picture back to represent what they think they looked like. And then we compared it to what they actually looked like. And those people who had more of, uh, who had eating disorders, obviously had a much different image of what they looked like. And generally, it was anywhere from 20 to 60%. 60% was obviously on the high side, larger than they really were. So understanding that a person who is looking in the mirror with an eating disorder is of, oftentimes not seeing the same thing as you are. You know, they are seeing something, uh, someone who is larger. 
There's undue influence of body shape and weight on self-evaluation. So this is a treatment issue that we want to look at. Why um, are you only lovable if you are a size whatever or if you weigh so much? And a persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. So again, we're looking at um, body dysmorphic disorder a little bit here too. The person may be looking in the mirror and seeing someone who in their mind is overweight. They're seeing an image that is bigger. They're not seeing the fact that their arms are five inches around or however big. Um, so we want to rule out um, what their perception is. We want to rule out body dysmorphic disorder in order to figure out, do they really conceptualize how thin they really are? Most people with anorexia don't. They don't see that. They see fat when they look in the mirror. And then you want to specify whether it's restricting or binge eating and purging. And so your next question might be, well, how do you differentiate anorexia with binge eating and purging from bulimia? And the biggest criterion is the refusal to maintain a minimal body weight. We want to rule out obsessive compulsive tendencies, uh, which are common in people with anorexia um, anorexia nervosa. One of the things that we find is the lower weight goes, the more people start to obsess about food, which when you think about it makes a lot of sense. The brain is trying to get you to feed it, to protect it so you can survive. Makes total sense. But when someone with anorexia is in that starvation mode, they'll start obsessing about food. They'll start obsessing about calories. They'll start obsessing about you know, what they might be able to eat. And it starts taking up a whole lot of their mental energy and time. And then there are compulsive rituals surrounding eating that a lot of times they need to engage in. So you want to rule out OCD um, when you're looking at anorexia, which obviously with OCD, you're not going to have that fear of getting fat and undue influence of body shape on self-evaluation. Please remember, and these numbers are so low because we have a lot of people who don't admit to it, who don't seek treatment. We have a lot of eating disorders that go undiagnosed. But even with that, 3.6% of males have an eating disorder. So let's not forget the guys in there. There is a lot of pressure put on men now that, you know, men's magazines are, you know, almost as... Uh, prevalent on the on the newsstands as the women's magazines that show men with like two percent body fat or one percent body fat the bodybuilders the emphasis on having that cut physique and those six pack abs and everything else it's a lot of pressure you know the guys experience the same um, media pressures that women do in many cases. Eating disorders are not just a childhood adolescent thing. They can start anywhere from puberty or even a little bit before up to age 40 is your average age of onset. Age of onset. Now, eating disorders can start earlier than puberty. It's not uncommon, um, but it is not the norm. And they can start later than 40. But again, th those are your outliers there. But up to age 40, someone can begin showing symptoms of an eating disorder. So a lot of times we rule out um, eating disorder diagnosis in our head when we have someone come in who is not your typical high school, college age person. And that would set us up to be wrong. So up to age 40, depressive symptoms can be present. So we want to rule out, are they restricting eating? Are they not eating because of depression? And if they've got depression, we need to make sure to treat it because they're going to have a hard time in their recovery if we're not also addressing that. So what causes depression in people with anorexia? Well, you've got, you know, cognitive and mood issues and, you know, potential body dysmorphic disorder. You also have, when somebody's weight goes really low, potential for anemia. Anemia can cause fatigue and lethargy and symptoms of depression. As we've talked about before, low estrogen or testosterone both affect the availability of serotonin and contribute. They're, they've done studies um, that 
you can find online that contribute to um, depressed mood when those either one of those are low estrogen for women testosterone for men uh, reduced thyroid hormones can occur in people when they're in that starvation area makes total sense again think about it the body is in starvation mode it's not getting enough food so it's going to turn down the thermostat it's going to say i can't use any more energy than i absolutely have to so everything else is going to start to slow down the other thing that can be um very dangerous are nutritional imbalances so the body can't make the neurotransmitters it needs to make to make your happy chemicals uh, to, but you also can have potassium imbalances and arrhythmias potassium imbalances can lead to cardiac arrest and other big problems so it's not something to play with and the arrhythmias can keep the oxygenated blood from effectively getting throughout the body which can contribute again to fatigue lethargy anxiety a variety of symptoms so we want to figure out if the person has anorexia and is presenting with depressive symptoms again what is causing them what is what is the etiology of those depressive symptoms and there's probably multiple but we can't i can't emphasize enough how important it is to have a medical doctor on the treatment team with someone even with if you can conceptualize mild anorexia even somebody who's only like five or ten percent below the norm um, we really want to get a, a doc in there common co-occurring disorders are depression and anxiety so um, again differentiate anorexia from obsess um, obsessive compulsive disorder don't forget men don't discount the late onset make sure we refer for a medical evaluation when somebody comes in and reports a history of you know restrictive dieting yo-yo dieting you know anything that might perk up your spidey senses a little bit that may say this person is nutritionally deficient which is going to negatively impact any other recovery we try to address because if their body can't make the neurotransmitters and stay balanced and regulated we're fighting an uphill battle and rule out body dysmorphic disorder as the primary binge eating disorder now this is kind of interesting when we look at it binge eating is characterized by both of the following eating in a discrete period of time within any two hour period is generally the rule um, window that you, they give you an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat during a similar period of time and under similar circumstances so you know i'm thinking to myself well what does that mean in our society i've seen people go to a restaurant and eat a big meal and put down five six thousand calories and you know i've seen people who are you know having a bad day eat an entire pizza or you know a a large amount of ice cream or half a chocolate cake now is that healthy um no but is it when we're looking at what most people would do in a similar time frame under similar circumstances if somebody else was really really stressed and they were self-soothing with food you know um you know is this behavior all that uncommon is it healthy no we're not saying that but we want to kind of look at normalizing what's going on and figuring out how often these binges occur so next criteria that has to be there is a sense of lack of control over eating during the episode a feeling that they can't stop eating or control how much they're eating um, and i find a lot of clients get some relief from this when i'm working with them if they instead of eating out of the bag when they have you know they're eating potato chips or oreos or whatever it is put it on a plate put it on a small plate force yourself to sit down you know changing some of their eating habits can help them get more control over their eating because mindless eating is very common in our society and so you may say okay last chip i'm not going to have any more and then the bag's just still sitting there and you may eat again and then the person can start feeling like they don't have any control or any willpower so we want to give them a sense of self-efficacy and we want to help them establish sort of ground rules so they can start controlling how much they eat 
but this is not necessarily going to make the binges go away. So we want to look at what's precipitating those binges. What function is the binge serving when we're talking about treatment? Binge episodes are associated with three of the following, eating much more rapidly than normal. Now, again, I don't know about you, but me, if I've gone all day long and I've skipped lunch and it's six o'clock at night and it's been like, you know, 12 hours since I've eaten or something, I'm probably going to inhale food and then worry about tasting it later. Um, when my son was little, he used to have gastric reflux really bad. And if we got 15 minutes without crying, it was, it was good. So anytime I would make food, I would kind of eat it as quickly as I could because I knew I was going to have to pick the baby up in short order. Um, yes, there are probably other ways to deal with that, yada, yada. But anyhow, so there are p times when I would eat much more rapidly than normal. But does it qualify as a binge? Eating until feeling uncomfortably full. Now, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And how many people do you know who after Thanksgiving meal kind of undoes their belt a little bit and they're like, oh my gosh, I ate way too much. We all do it occasionally. So we're normalizing. Eating large amounts of food when not feeling phys physically hungry. I think we've all done that occasionally. Eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by how much one is eating. So that's one of those indicators that people are embarrassed to eat in public. Um, but we also want to look, when I see that one, I start thinking, let's rule out bulimia here. Because a lot of times people with bulimia, their self-evaluation is very strongly based on their body shape and size. So they feel like people are judging them when they're out eating, no matter how much they're eating. Um, so, you know, we're looking at binge eating disorder. Obviously, with binge eating disorder, you don't have the um, compensatory mechanisms that you do in bulimia. And a binge eat uh, episode can be characterized by feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or very guilty afterwards. When you're looking at the bag and you're like, I ate an entire bag of M&Ms. You know, and again, sometimes we do that. And, and when I'm talking to clients and trying to figure out what's going on, most of the time I don't want them to get all that hung up on making a diagnosis. I want to look at what symptoms are bothering them, and let's just deal with those. Uh, but we do talk about the fact that, you know, sometimes people do, people do occasionally binge. I mean, even people without binge eating disorder. What does that mean to them? What does that mean about them if they occasionally binge? What, what do they think about their best friend who may occasionally binge, you know? What does that mean? And we also look at society and, you know, how much society kind of um, encourages us to eat so often. Binge eating disorders characterized by marked distress regarding binge eating. So if they're embarrassed about it, if there's marked distress, if they feel like they're spending way too much money on the food that they're binge eating on, um, if they're having significant health problems because of their weight because of the binge eating, then we might start looking at that. Binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months. So we want to look at the, the time criteria. It's not associated with the current use of inappropriate compensatory behaviors, so that helps us rule out bulimia. Um, understand that binge eating disorder is less common but much more severe than overeating. So it's not just going to a restaurant and having a big meal. It is eating, you know, several thousand calories in a particular setting, you know, 10,000, 20,000 calories. Binge eating disorder is associated with more subjective distress regarding the eating behavior than just normal overeating. People who just overeat, you know, and it's not a binge, it's not binge eating disorder, they're like, oh, I'm going to have to do an extra hour at the gym tomorrow or something, and they're done with it. You know, they don't beat themselves up for the rest of the night about how much they ate or feel bad about it or feel totally disempowered and, and defeated. So, again, we're looking at a continuum. We have overeating over here, which is, well, get back on the screen. Overeating, which is, you know, normal. People do it occasionally. And then we've got binge eating, which not only tends to ha involve more calories in a shorter period of time, but it has a lot more distress associated with it. 
And then bulimia, recurrent episodes of binge eating, which we just went through, and inappropriate compensatory behavior in order to pre prevent weight gain. Self-induced vomiting, that's one of them. Misuse of laxatives, that's another issue that we want to consider. Misuse of diuretics or other me medications. And, um, and this can include uh, diet pills that they think are going to speed up their metas metabolism, um, amphetamines, anything like that that they think is going to help them um, have less of an appetite and speed up their metabolism. Fasting. So you may see people who binge and then they don't eat for two days and then they binge and they don't eat for two days. Or excessive exercise. And so what does excessive mean? We want to look at the average. I mean, if somebody's in, in the gym for an hour, that's different than if they're, if they're in the gym for six hours. Um, so paying attention to the excessive exercise and also in terms of how is it affecting their life? You know, spending occasionally spending a couple hours in the gym isn't that uncommon for some people going on a really long run is not that uncommon for people especially people training for marathons or something is that excessive exercise and when i'm talking with clients i'm looking for things like they're exercising despite the fact that they're starting to have you know joint problems they they are exercising um or their exercise takes precedence over everything else in their life. So they give up hobbies, they give up spending time with family when it's really important, um, or they set their work schedule around their exercise and they just can't function if they don't exercise that day. So that's what I'm looking at is, you know, does the anxiety level go through the roof if somebody can't exercise, especially after they've binged? Binge eating and inappropriate compensatory behaviors both occur, on average, at least once a week for three months. Self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight, just like with anorexia. The disturbance doesn't occur exclusively during the episodes of anorexia. And, and remember, the biggest defining feature is the person's um, body weight, whether they are um, meeting the criteria for anorexia because they refuse to maintain minimum body weight. Most people with bulimia are average or slightly above average body weight. We also want to rule out histrionic and borderline personality disorder. Um, one of the things that we see is as a co-occurring sometimes with um, bulimia is people having histrionic tendencies, histrionic characteristics in their behaviors, overly sexualized behaviors. There's a strong correlation between trauma, especially um, childhood sexual trauma, and the development of bulimia later in life. So sometimes we see some histrionic characteristics. It may be something that needs to be addressed in treatment in order for the eating disorder to completely um, remit because if someone is unduly concerned with their shape and body size engaging in overly sexualized behavior in order to get approval um, then you know we've got to look at what does your body shape mean does it mean you're only lovable if you are a sexual being and the same thing with borderline personality disorder we see that come out a lot um, in people who've had early childhood sexual trauma so it may be another co-occurring issue that we want to attend to if it's present. So you want to take a look at the personality disorders, make sure there's not one that also needs to be attended to. The current severity of bulimia, mild one to three episodes of inappropriate compensatory behaviors per week. So <clears throat> moderate is four to seven episodes. So we're looking at, you know, about one a day. Severe is 18 to 13, 8 to 13 episodes per week. And extreme is 14 or more episodes of inappropriate compensatory behavior per week. I will share with you when I was in college um, at my sorority, purging was sort of a natural or an expected behavior. Um, so I would say that the majority of women in my sorority uh, met the moderate criteria because, you know, after meals, the bathrooms would be busy for quite a while. So we're looking at anywhere from 
seven to 14 um, episodes per week. So we want to be cognizant. Now, when we're working with people who are in a community that supports that kind of behavior, you know, you're going to have a lot of resistance to changing the behavior because it's sort of enculturated in, in that particular community. So, you know, something that also probably will pop up as a treatment issue occasionally. People with eating disorders very often don't have peers that they share it with, but there are those occasional um, groups that uh, will provide social pressure to the person to maintain the <clears throat> compensatory behaviors. Okay, other common issues in eating disorder treatment that we want to consider from a therapist's point of view. Nutritional imbalances. When someone is uh, coming in, whether it's bulimia, anorexia, even binge eat disorder, generally you're not going to binge eat on the healthy things. So if somebody is binge eating on, you know, Krispy Kreme donuts, they're not getting their nutritional profile met. So we want to look at nutritional imbalances, make sure that they're being assessed for um, nutritional deficiencies by a medical professional to make sure, again, that they can make the neurotransmitters they need to in order to feel happy and calm and all that. We also don't want to assume lack of knowledge. One of the quickest ways to get someone with an eating disorder to shut down is to start educating them about what healthy eating is and what they need to eat and what carbohydrates are. They, most of them know that probably better than most registered dietitians. They eat, sleep, and breathe calories, carbohydrates, macros, micros. You know, it's, it's part of what they obsess about. It's part of what they focus on. So we don't want to assume they lack knowledge. We want to look at, again, what's the behavior functioning for? What is the basis of the behavior? It's not that they don't know how to eat well. It's serving a different purpose. Um, we also want to look at issues of sleep deprivation. Someone who is sleep deprived is going to maintain low levels of stress, which is going to make it harder for them. You know, it's going to reduce the amount of available serotonin and all that kind of stuff going back to our HPA axis. Um, but we're also going to look at issues of hunger. You know, if they're hungry, it may keep, be keeping them from sleeping. Or they could be uncomfortable because they've been abusing laxatives, because they're hungry, because they're malnourished. Um, any of those things can negatively impact sleep, which is going to negatively impact what we're trying to do and their ability to not only feel happier, but also remember and learn those things. Because if they're focused on food and they're, in a group therapy session and all they're thinking about is what can I eat that's within my calorie limit for today, they're not hearing what you're saying. They're not able to focus on that and retain it. So we want to make sure they're getting enough sleep so they can focus, they can retain stuff, they don't create symptoms of depression. We want to treat mood issues um, with the person that has an eating disorder, but most people, especially if they present and they say, I've got an eating disorder, if you tell them we're going to treat, you know, these other anxiety issues or whatever, and once you develop the coping skills, you won't need to binge anymore, or you won't need to restrict anymore, so that's just secondary. They're also probably going to walk out of your office because they don't feel heard. They're presenting and saying, I've got a problem. I have, I feel like I have no control over this, and I need to feel like I've got some sense of control. Um, so some people, although, you know, well-meaning, may minimize the impact of the binging, the purging, the restricting, um, which will turn off a lot of clients and may make them feel even more hopeless and helpless and isolated. And failing to address the rebound effects from laxative and diuretic abuse. When you've been abusing diuretics and you stop, a lot of times people experience um, water retention, fluid retention for several days or even a couple of weeks um, afterwards while the body's trying to adjust to, oh, wow, we've got a lot of fluid coming in here and the person's not using the diuretics. So we want to 
pay attention to that. Now, remembering laxative abuse and diuretic abuse can also cause problems with internal organs. So uh, something that the MD needs to assess. Laxative abuse can also cause the colon to become lazy, if you will. And when people stop using laxatives, they will become constipated. They may have difficulty going to the bathroom, which will increase their feelings of gassiness and bloating, which will increase their feeling of, oh my gosh, you know, I, I feel so bloated. I can't exist like this. If this is what recovery is like, I can't do it. Helping people understand the process of basically getting the body back online. And it takes several months helping them make sure to work with a nutritionist and a physician to, you know, ease that transition to ensure um, treatment compliance is going to be really important um, because they start freaking out if this, you know, if they're constipated, the scale is going to go up, if the scale goes up markedly, you know, it's, it's a shock, it's a huge anxiety trigger. So we want to kind of look at working with them to address that. So moving on from uh, eating disorders, because, you know, they are really prevalent, unfortunately, in our society more so than I would like to think. Uh, so we need to pay attention to what's out there and whether our clients are struggling with an eating disorder. Substance use disorders. Now, I know the type's a little small here, but I wanted it all on the same page. Taking the substance in larger amounts and for a longer period than intended. Wanting to cut down or quit, but not being able to. Spending a lot of time obtaining the substance. Craving or a strong desire to use the substance. Failure to carry out major obligations at work, school, or home due to use. Continued use despite persistent or recurring social, interpersonal, physical, psychological problems caused or made worse by use. Stopping or reducing important social, occupational, or recreational activities due to use and recurrent use of substances in physically hazardous situations. Now, tolerance is indicated by an increased need um, for increased amounts of the su substance or diminished effect with the use of the same amount. And when we, when we get down to gambling disorder, you will see how these same criteria are basically worded a little bit differently, but they're the, pretty much the same criteria. Gamblers, for example, need to gamble more money. They need to take bigger risks in order to get the same rush that they got before. Withdrawal syndrome or, uh, uh, or the substance is used to avoid withdrawal. So when somebody stops using, you know, let's take alcohol, for example. We've talked about alcohol a lot. And they start to detox from the alcohol. There are characteristic signs of alcohol withdrawal, including the increase in blood pressure and anxiety. Um, or the person may be like, no, you know, I, I can't go through withdrawal. I'm not going to go with, through withdrawal. But in order to prevent those symptoms, they have to continue to use. So, you know, you may see somebody who hasn't experienced withdrawal because they're not willing to stop long enough for their body to actually cl cleanse it out of their system. Now, one of the caveats here is this does not apply when the drug is used appropriately under medical supervision. So let's think about opiates here. Um, you know, some people have persistent pain from, you know, a car accident, from, you know, a wartime injury, whatever. And nothing else handles their pain. They've tried, you know, gabapentin and some of, some of the other medications out there that are supposed to help. Um, and it's just not working for them. So they're on opiate-based medications. So. Do they need to take the substance in larger amounts over a period of time? Well, yeah, they do because their body adjusts to it and they develop a tolerance and a withdrawal to it. Um, but what we don't see in people who are using it appropriately under medical use, uh, supervision is continued use despite persistent interpersonal social problems, using in hazardous situations, or the reduction in important social, occupational, and rec recreational activities due to use. Now, they may not be doing those things due to pain, but they're not doing it due to use. So they're not avoiding going to their kid's ball game because they want to stay home and shoot heroin. They are not going to their kid's ball game because they're in too much pain 
even though they're taking the medication as prescribed. Will people who are um, taking it appropriately under medical supervision experience cravings sometimes? Yeah, they will, especially if they miss a dose. Will they spend a lot of time obtaining the substance? You know, probably not unless, you know, your doctor has a really long wait and is never running on time. Some people who are on prescribed opiate medications want to cut down, but they're not able to do it. It's not because... It, it's because the pain is too bad. The pain is too severe. It's not because of the drug interaction. It's because when they start cutting down, even when they let their endogenous opioids kick back in, there's just too much pain for them to have a quality of life. So some people may want to quit that, cut down or quit and not be able to do it because the underlying physical issue is just too severe. So we want to look at, you know, not... Um, stigmatizing people. We also want to look at, you know, when we start talking about medication-assisted therapy, methadone, buprenorphine, suboxone, those sorts of things, um, all of those things are also going to be present in, in many circumstances. So we want to look at, is this a substance use disorder or, you know, are they able to carry out major obligations at work, school, and home? Whoops. Um, now that they're on methadone, when they were shooting heroin, they couldn't do that. Um, are they continuing to use, um, and while they're using, while they're on the medication-assisted therapy, are they experiencing, as a result of the medication-assisted therapy, recurring social, interpersonal, physical, or psychological problems? Generally, the answer is no. My experience is most people, once they get on medication-assisted therapy and they're in a treatment program, they tend to start doing a lot better. So just kind of bearing that in mind because in recovery circles um, and, and certain self-help groups and stuff, the use of medication-assisted therapy is greatly frowned upon um, and the belief that some people need to be on pain medication for their entire lives, for the entire rest of their lives, is not accepted by some people. So we really want to look at the individual and, and talk about, you know, what's going on with them. Told you we'd move up to gambling disorder because that was added in the DSM-5. So, you know, we're starting to see the switch, the move of um, the American Psychiatric Association to look at addictions and starting to look at behavioral addictions. And the next one we're going to look at is internet gaming disorder. That didn't make the cut. That is in areas for further study, but it did make it into the book. So we're starting to see an acceptance or an awareness that there are things other than substances that can cause people significant psychosocial or, or physical problems, um, and it can also contribute to psychological and mood issues. So I think that's an awesome positive step that we're starting to legitimize people's suffering, if you will. And we're saying, yeah, you know, we can see it's a problem instead of, eh, there's nothing I can do. Um, so gambling disorder. We're looking at a 12-month period here, and a person needs to have four of the criteria. Needs to gamble with increasing amounts of money for excitement. You know, if they started out with quarter slots and they're up to the $20 tables or whatever, I don't gamble, so I'm just kind of winging it here. Um, you know, we're seeing an increase is restless or irritable when attempting to cut down or stop gambling. So if they can't go bet on the ponies or bet on the sports games or fantasy football or whatever it is, they start getting really irritable and crankly, cranky and restless. And especially if they figure out that they could have won some money, they can get really cantankerous. Have made repeated unsuccessful efforts to control or stop gambling. So, you know, if they're put in... A situation maybe they play poker at a buddy's house and they say you know I'm gonna stop after I lose five hundred dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever it is and they keep going and even though they said this is my hard line I'm gonna stop here they keep going after that and they are unable to quit the game at that point it qualifies is often preoccupied with gambling when feeling distressed so they start getting anxious whether it's about um, money or not, gambling 
when you're gambling, it takes a lot of mental focus to figure out what you're going to bet on or play the game that you're playing. So people can start kind of drifting off and start thinking about gambling when stress gets really high because they're looking for that escape. They're looking for that rush. After losing money, gambling often returns another day to get even. So they're chasing the high. They're trying to come back. They're trying to get even, trying to win their money back, but they're also trying to get that rush because they left on a, on a down. Um, if you want to make a parallel with drugs, it's like getting a, a bad hit of something and having a really bad high experience. A lot of people will come back and, and try to do it again going, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. They lie to conceal the extent of involvement with gambling. They've jeopardized or lost significant relationships, jobs, or ec educational or career opportunities because of gambling. You know, gambling a lot of times um, is not during the day. It's at night, so people stay up really, really late. So they may be barely conscious when they're at work, and they may get terminated. They may have difficulty in their relationships because they're always going out gambling instead of staying home or going out with their significant others to do something else. Um, likewise, people, I, I know people who've gotten in trouble at work gambling. They can't even put gambling aside long enough to be at work, so they end up getting terminated for that. And they rely on others to provide money to relieve desperate financial situations caused by gambling. Not everybody has to meet this criteria before they meet gambling disorder. Remember, they only have to meet four of these criteria. Um, a lot of times, people are not going to present for treatment until they get into those situations that are financially desperate. But paying attention, especially if you're in, in an area where there is a lot of gambling that's prevalent, there's casinos, there's those things... Definitely pay attention to that. But even in places where there's not, there's always poker games and, you know, online betting. Online gambling is huge. And if you go to the right sites, there are a lot of places that will tempt people and they'll give them the first $500 worth of chips free. So to the gambler, they may get on and go, well, you know, what can it hurt because I'm not spending any money. But then they lose that 500 that they got free. And then they start putting their own money into it. So the online gambling establishment sort of entice people to get started. And then once they get started, hope that the person can't stop. Gambling behavior is not better explained by a manic episode. When people are manic, and this is not new news, they will engage in thrill-seeking, impulsive behaviors. They can be wide open for days on end. And sometimes people engage in a lot of gambling during this. It's risk-taking. It's thrill-seeking. Um, so we want to rule out, is this person in a manic episode? You know, is there a history of bipolar disorder? Um, or could it be the onset of bipolar disorder? Or is it just gambling? Um, when bipolar is not adequately controlled, um, people may engage in gambling behavior during a manic episode, which there's, there was a recent lawsuit against one of the medications for bipolar disorder, um, claiming that people who took that medication um, also sometimes developed a gambling problem. And my thought was, well, doesn't that tell you that the medication wasn't very effective because it didn't stabilize the manic episode? But that was just me. Um, so we want to rule, rule that out. You want to specify if it's episodic um, or if it's persistent. And persistent means continuous for multiple years, because remember, we're looking at criteria for a year just for diagnosis. And then you can specify whether it's in early remission or sustained remission. But for remission, it says none of the criteria can have been met for 12 months or longer. So, you know, there's a lot of criteria there that may be met in 12 months. So it's hard for people to get in full remission. And finally, internet gaming, well, not finally, one more after this, internet gaming disorder. Right now, um, repetitive use of internet games causing significant issues with functioning. Five criteria must be met within a year. Preoccupation with the games, withdrawal when not playing the games, 
tolerance, more time is needed to be spent playing the games. Now, if you know anybody back in early 2000s, I think it was, when World of Warcraft became really popular. I know people who, you know, called in sick to work and ended up getting divorced. Um, I know two people who ended up getting divorced over their engagement in World of Warcraft. So, you know, it can get to be um, an obsessive kind of behavior. Tried to stop or curb playing, but failed to do so. Has had a loss of interest in other life activities, such as hobbies. They just come home, get on the computer, play until it's time for bed, or maybe even forego sleep. Um, and we've seen pictures of, or media portrayals of gamers who wear adult diapers and have food brought to them. They don't even get up to go to the bathroom or eat. Um, the per person has had continued overuse of internet games, even when knowledge of how much they were impacting their life. So they may look around and go, yeah, um, my wife left me, I lost my job, but you know, whatever. They've lied to others about the extent of their internet game use. Use internet games to relieve anxiety or guilt. It's, it's a way to escape. And has lost or put at risk an opportunity or relationship because of internet games. Right now, the internet gaming disorder only includes internet games. It does not include general use of the internet, online gambling, that would go under gambling criteria, and it does not include social media. So for those of you who are hoping there was a diagnosis for somebody who's addicted to Facebook, it doesn't exist right now. Um, so, you know, those are things that we're kind of looking at. But anytime somebody comes into our office and they evidence these criteria, preoccupation, withdrawal, tolerance, inability to stop, and two or more problems in life because of their use of whatever it is, you know, it is a clinically significant issue that needs to be addressed, regardless of whether the DSM has a diagnosis for it or not. Sex addiction has also not made it into the DSM yet, despite what all of the um, internet would have you believe. You know, because it's on the internet, it must be true, right? Um, sex addiction is not a, an official diagnosis. What they're looking at is hoping to try to get it included in the next version of the DSM as an area for further study. Um, but the criteria they're using is similar to the others. Recurrent failure to resist sexual impulses, engaging in sexual behaviors to a greater extent or for longer than intended, unsuccessful efforts to stop, excessive time spent obtaining sex, being sexual, or recovering from sexual experiences, obsessed with parent preparing for sexual activities, frequently engaged in sexual behavior when expected to be fulfilling occupational, academic, domestic, or social obligations. I can't tell you how many people I've had to write up for looking at porn while they were at work. <clears throat> Continued sexual behavior despite knowing it's caused or exacerbated <clears throat> problems in their life. Increased intensity, frequency, number, or risk of sexual behaviors to achieve the desired effect. So sometimes people will go to something that's more shocking, um, <clears throat> which is one of the ways we see the development of, you know, once they've looked at all of the average run-of-the-mill porn, we see people going to more hardcore stuff. Given up or limited social, occupational, or recreational activities because of the sexual behavior and become upset, anxious, or restless if unable to engage in the behavior. Um, one of the big uh, controversies is that sex is a natural behavior. So who are we to say what's normal and what's abnormal, what frequency is normal? And I think what the proponents of this diagnosis um, come back with is we're not saying we're looking at frequency for what's normal or abnormal. We're looking at how is it impacting the person psychologically, occupationally, interpersonally, is it causing them problems? Is it forming a major portion of their day where they're obsessing about it and they're giving up other things that they used to like? That's what I'm gleaning from the material that I read about the people that are pushing to have this added as a diagnosis. <clears throat> as I said, it's not currently an area for further study or in the DSM-5. Um, but we're seeing 
a gradual opening of awareness to behavioral type addictions. Um, what do we do? How do we treat someone who presents claiming to have sex addiction? You know, obviously we're not going to go, well, that's not in the DSM, so it's private pay or nothing. But a lot of the treatment centers, that's what they're doing now. They advertise, they treat sex addiction, and they say that most insurance companies cover addiction treatment. What they fail to say is, unless you have another addiction that's actually in the DSM, insurance ain't going to pay for it in every case that I know. Now, there could be exceptions, obviously. <clears throat> You want to assess for concurrent diagnoses. If somebody presents with um, sex addiction, do they have other things that may be motivating that compulsive behavior? Are they trying to basically self-medicate? Are they dealing with adjustment disorder, dependent personality, depression, histrionic personality, or PTSD? Um, those are, you know, common diagnoses which you could see co-occurring with sex or pornography addiction so if you're trying to work with somebody who's presented and they're in a great amount of distress and they have you know a self-diagnosed sex addiction um, but they also have other issues going on um, you know you can code for those issues and get reimbursed for those it may not be enough to sessions to treat the sex addiction but it can get the person started. Um, addiction treatment issues. We always, regardless of what the addiction is or what they proclaim their addiction is, examine the reasons or the function of the use to er identify areas for intervention. What triggers their use? Is it anxiety? Is it stress? Is it sobering up? Um, you know, we also want to look at when you're using, you're disrupting the neurotransmitter balance. So you know, when you stop using, you're probably going to experience some depression and or anxiety. Um, and, and so when the person tries to stop on their own, they experience these dysphoric emotions and they're like, ah, and they may return to use in order to not feel that way. Um, so we want to look at what needs to be done to get the person through the initial um, acute withdrawal period. And what other functions is this behavior serving? If it's to help them deal with stress, anxiety, or depression, well, what's causing those? And we want to help people develop distress tolerance skills to deal with urges. Even after they're in recovery, or however you want to say it, um, there are going to be times when they're triggered, and they have the desire to use again. They think about using again. Um, and that can be really scary for somebody who has been addicted to something. So we want to help them develop those distress tolerance skills to deal with the urges. One um, analogy I use for some of my clients is thinking about uh, a bumblebee, you know, assuming you're not deathly allergic to them. If a bee lands on your arm, your immediate urge is probably to swipe it off. You know, if a fly lands on me, my natural instinct, my immediate urge is to wipe it off. Now, if you swat a bumblebee, what's going to happen? It's probably going to come back and sting you. So distress tolerance skills is like dealing with that bumblebee, taking a breath and deciding, you know what, I don't want to get stung, so I'm going to tolerate the bee sitting there. Even though it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, I'm going to tolerate it sitting on my arm until it's ready to fly away, which will be in a few minutes. So in summary, addictions and eating disorders can occur alone or concurrently with mood, medical, psychotic, or personality disorders. So we want to make sure to really do a comprehensive assessment because we need to address all of the areas of presentation. Common errors. We want to make sure to differentiate eating disorders from obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, if they are using it ritualistically, if they're having obsessions about it. Um, don't forget males in your eating disorder diagnosis or discount late onset. For men or women, it can have an initial presentation, you know, as late as 40 years old, and that's still within the norm range. Ensure that we make referrals to physicians for eating disorders, alcohol, or benzo misuse, not even necessarily meeting the criteria for substance use disorder. Um, Generally, you know, we should be referring, making sure the person's had a physical when they present for anything to rule out physiological causes. 
but alcohol and benzo withdrawal can be life-threatening um, and eating disorders can put the person in a um, position where they're damaging their organs and in a life-threatening position. Rule out body dysmorphic disorder with eating disorders. It can co-occur, but you want to make sure it's not just BDD. Emotional eating likely doesn't meet criteria for binge eating, so we don't want to assume that. Address nutritional imbalances, you know, send them to a physician, get them with a registered dietitian. For any people that we're working with, whether it's somebody who's got a gambling disorder and they've been up drinking and gambling all the time and they're not eating well, or the person with an eating disorder. Make sure to address sleep deprivation in the treatment plan. Don't treat mood issues and expect food issues to spontaneously remit. Address the rebound effects from laxative and diuretic abuse. Addiction treatment does not apply when the substance is being used appropriately under medical supervision. So we don't want to, you know, necessarily diagnose somebody with an addiction if they're using it appropriately. And rule out bipolar disorder, specifically a manic episode, when we're evaluating somebody for gambling disorder. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And if you're here tomorrow, I will be. Um, remember, we don't have class on Thursday because it's Thanksgiving. If I didn't, um, uh, if I didn't what? I lost my train of thought. Oh, if I don't see you tomorrow, have a very happy Thanksgiving, and I will see you next week. If you enjoy this podcast, please like and subscribe, either in your podcast player or on YouTube. You can attend and participate in our live webinars with Dr. Snipes by subscribing at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. This episode has been brought to you in part by allceus.com, providing 24-7 multimedia continuing education and pre-certification training to counselors, therapists, and nurses since 2006. Use coupon code counselor toolbox to get a 20% discount off your order this month.